recording. recording. Perfect. Um, so we want to welcome you to our first box turtle talk and really our first talk through um, Philly nature. Um, so um, myself, Sandy Vincenti and um, Bernard Billy Brown, our co-hosts tonight, um, founded back in February, well really it was a conversation I think even started in October and an idea probably even before then to um, sort of start a organization may be a really broad term for it, but start a way for folks to learn more about um, reptiles and other animals throughout the city of Philadelphia, and then also a way to bridge together all of these different events and ideas and things that were happening in the different uh, organizations and science and environmental education type organizations and what they do together to sort of be a, a, a hub for Philly Nature. Um, so we founded and launched phillynature.org in February, and it's really in its hatchling stage to throw a turtle pun in there. Um, so we're really adding to it as we go, and, and Billy's been really kicking butt on that. Um, so I don't know, Billy, did you want to just throw a quick screen grab of the website up, or we want to do that at the end? Sorry, I know we talked about that. You're still muted. Oh, there you go. Are we seeing the website now? I am seeing it now. All right, so um, let me do a quick switch of the tabs just because I realized the way Zoom is displaying, um, it is not letting me, it is being funky with getting to full screen on this. Um, but this is our overall website. Um, if you scroll down, we've got things like a guide to animals at this point. We keep adding things and so, um, we're going to get to fungi, we're going to get to plants, um, we're going to get to invertebrates, which we're working on right now. But we started with the bigger stuff that people tend to notice first. Um, we've also got uh, other resources about you know, ideas for places to go and other ways to learn about nature in Philadelphia. Um, we've got some ideas for how people can um, contribute uh, both to knowledge of biodiversity in Philadelphia as well as supporting it. And then um, we've got videos we that we have been producing with Grid Magazine. And we'll add this to our video list. Um, and then we also have what I've been pulling together as an events calendar. So that um, if you're thinking, hey, I'm into doing different kinds of nature stuff, whether that's talks and walks or um, volunteer events, uh, this is a way that you can just check one place, hopefully, and get some ideas for what you might want to do next weekend or, or on a Tuesday, whatever kind of day you're thinking of. Um, and then we've got in the guide, um, what we've been starting with are, uh, you know, just really brief uh, accounts of or descriptions of, of stuff you might find, um, but then where you can click through and see more in-depth uh, descriptions of uh, and accounts uh, profiles of animals around Philadelphia. So if we do, for example, American beavers, um, we get in here and it's a much longer description and discussion of them with some links to ways you can find out more about them. So with that, I'm going to return it to the slideshow. Perfect. And I'm going to mute myself. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so that is definitely a living, breathing website, and it is being um, constantly updated, and so it's a great, great resource for folks to kind of keep an eye on and go to for their Philly nature needs. Um, I do want to, there is a, a page on there that tells a little bit more about our backgrounds, but I wanted to do a little bit of that too so that you know who we are. Um, and Nikki, as you said, you don't know that much about turtles. I can say um, for myself particularly that um, that I am not an expert either. It's just been a passion and, and love project for me for many, many years. Um, by career and degree, I'm actually a, a more of a formal educator, an elementary and early childhood educator, but my career started out working at the Philadelphia Zoo, directing their uh, education departments and early childhood departments. Um, and then I've worked in a couple other education spaces, but I've always been drawn more to environmental education. I was recently the director of early childhood at the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. Oh, yay, Nikki works in pre-K too. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so it was kind of a great marriage of both worlds to work in early childhood and then really sort of bring um, the love of nature and the love of animals to children. So with that being said, um, several years ago when I moved to the city, I bought a house, a small house on, intentionally because there was a, two lots next door. So I've since turned them into a very 
very micro environmental education space demonstration garden. Um, and just recently in 2019 had it um, incorporated as a nonprofit, as a 501. Um, so I was doing that sort of in the garden, but then a lot of folks were asking me to come do outreach. So I was doing outreach in the neighborhood and various green spaces for several years under um, the name Nature Heroes. Um, so really doing that. And that's how Billy found me through um, just doing that and really just kind of always looking for partnerships and kind of putting my my nose into environmental education spaces um, so that I could continue to learn more because that's one of the things I love doing. Um, and that's kind of where this partnership started off. So um, with my work through the garden, which you'll see at the bottom of some of the slides is called a child's inspiration, it's a wildlife discovery garden um, and the nature heroes. And then that led brilliantly into Philly nature under that giant umbrella there. So. That's a little bit about me, but I'm going to tag it to you, Billy, if you want to unmute and give a little bit of an intro to yourself. Sure. Um, I, uh, I'm not a professional herpetologist. I should probably have that as a disclaimer on everything I say, um, but I have been into reptiles and amphibians since before I can remember. Um, I used to be much more into keeping and breeding them in captivity, but I'd say in my 30s or late 20s, I made a big shift into uh, observing them much more in the wild. And so I've been involved in citizen science efforts and uh, outreach efforts uh, around education around reptile and amphibian diversity. Um, we'll mention the PA Amphibian and Reptile Survey PARS in here. Um, and I do also some, uh, you know, some, I got my toe into some research projects having to do with, uh, with turtles. Uh, and so I, 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 I'll, that's where my knowledge of this comes and my passion from it comes. Uh, and I'll be careful about not speaking beyond my expertise level, I'll put it that way. If I don't know something, then I'll definitely check the reference books or, or give some ideas of where we can find more information. Perfect. Putting that teacher hat back on, that's something I always love to do as a teacher is if I don't know it, be really blatant about that. I don't know it, let's look it up together. Sometimes, sometimes I'd even lie to the kids and tell them I didn't know. Um, but just to tag on to and add, um, you know, reptiles in particular and invertebrates are sort of some of my bigger loves in the animal world. So that's where a lot of this comes from with my love as well. Um, all right, so we did welcome intro. Um, like I said, I think we're really good on <laughs> expectations and adequate etiquette. Um, Nikki, you're doing great with muting, but because it's just you, Nikki, we can be a little bit more informal. So feel free to unmute yourself, interrupt us, ask a question, or you know, you've been using the chat really wonderfully too. So whatever's comfortable for you, we're informal. So we can certainly um, flow with it as it's gonna go tonight. Um, so just a real quick overview of sort of the agenda or the topics we're going to touch on. Um, we're going to start off with, um, yep, yeah, you can totally jump off whenever you need to. I, it will be recorded so you can come back to it. Um, so we're going to start off with the reptile and turtle basics. So very basic, what's a reptile, what's a turtle. Um, review of some of the turtles that you might see in Philadelphia outside of just box turtles. And then we'll go over some box turtle basics, what to do if you find a box turtle, how you can help them, and status of some of the box turtles in Philadelphia. And then we'll end with a QA. and a um, We have time for that. So without further ado, um, turtles are indeed reptiles. So turtles are one of five groups of reptiles. So there's five different types of reptiles, sort of general groups. Um, turtles, obviously, then you have snakes, lizards, crocodilians, crocodiles, alligators, um, caimans, things like that. And then tuataras, which are a group that not many folks know about. So tuatara is a Maori word, meaning peaks on the back. So a tuatara looks a lot like a lizard. Um, and in fact, they're the last living reptile relatives of lizards found over 200 million years ago when dinosaurs were around. Um, you can only find them in New Zealand. Um, like I said, they look very similar to lizards, but lizards will have um, sort of an external eardrum that you can see, sort of a hole. They don't have necessarily like a flat like we do as mammals. Um, so they will not have that. Um, and they actually have a really odd third eye um, which is really fascinating to most scientists because they're not really sure exactly what its purpose is, um, but it actually does have a retina, it has lens, it has cornea, it has nerves, but they can't see. Um, so it's really odd sort of setting it into that fifth classification. Um, they also have an odd second set of upper teeth, which is weird. So just a little bit about Twin Taurus, because when I mention it, most folks don't know what it is, but that is the fifth of the five groups of reptiles. Um, all reptiles in particular are covered in scales and for turtles specifically it's scoots. So just the larger 
scales that kind of cover the shell a little bit harder. Um, all reptiles shed their skin. So snakes, as most folks know, will shed in one long connected shed. Um, a lot of other reptiles may shed, rep lizard, lizards in particular will shed in like pieces. It'll come off in pieces. Um, reptiles lay eggs with a little bit of a, not a catch all in that, but that's something we can go into another time. Um, but they all do lay eggs, whether they lay them externally or they kind of hold them internally. Um, what are the main differences between reptile eggs and bird eggs or reptile eggs tend to be a little bit more leathery and a little bit softer, a little bit squishier than the hard shelled, you know, bird chicken eggs that you may eat or see. Um, and lastly, it's a little bit of a interesting thing for folks who don't know is they're ectothermic, which is cold blooded is the term you may hear more often. Um, and it's pretty much the opposite of us. So we're endothermic, meaning we produce our own heat. Um, reptiles, on the other hand, need to rely on external sources, the sun, um, warm rocks, warm roadsides, which we will definitely get into to help them regulate um, sort of their internal temperature, which is why you'll see a lot of reptiles doing just that, being out sunning, sitting on the rocks and the, the roadsides to get their body temperatures up enough to give them the energy to be able to process their food, go catch their food, um, things like that. So that's a little bit about reptiles. Like I said, Nikki, if you have questions, this is, you know, if it's a lot of information, you can totally interrupt or put something in the chat and hopefully I'll see it. Um, so turtle armor. And Billy, if you have things to add, if I'm missing anything or I'm miss touching on something, jump in. Um, go ahead. No, oh, you were You're doing swell. Awesome. So one of the things that makes turtles obviously unique from those other uh, four groups of reptiles is their shell. Um, so turtles have a protective, it, the upper shell is called a carapace and the bottom lower part of the shell is called a plastron. Um, what is really interesting and what most folks, um, especially I, I love this with children is that shell is actually a, a part of their body. Um, so with children, I tend to talk about, since you're a pre-K teacher, Nikki, you'll understand this. I talk about, um, well, actually I'll have them feel their spine in their back and I'll talk about, well, could you take your spine off for the night to go to bed? And they'll usually say, no, you know, so that's one of the things that is, is really, um, particular about turtles is they can't, they can't take their shells off. They're not like, uh, Hermit crabs, where they're going to change out of their shells. It's, it's, it's part of them. It's connected. Um, their shell is actually their spine and their ribs. Um, so taking it off would prove fatal. Um, so you can probably see in the pictures, um, the first picture is that top shell uh, carapace, the bottom is the plastron, and you can see in there, and I, I have one too I can show on the screen, um, the, oh, thanks, Billy. Um, the one picture you could see, and I don't know if you can see this, so this is actually a, a bleached, I, ended, I actually got this at a local um, antique store. Um, this is a bleached uh, box turtle shell. Um, but you can kind of see in, hopefully it's not too glary. Let's see if I can get this down. That's going to be really glary. Can you see that? Okay, Nikki. You cannot. It's here. really white, really bright. Oh, I screen. thought the white would be better, but it seems like it's not. Hold on. Do you have like a black? Yeah, or something. <laughs> you learn tricks of the trade. Okay. Is that better? A little better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of old and a little bit broken, but right at the top here, is a piece of the vertebrate left over in the vertebrae. So you can kind of see how literally in the shell is that spine is those, or those vertebrae. So they can absolutely not take it off. It is a part of them. It's one of the reasons why when um, a turtle does get um, hit on the road or injured in another way, it can be, you know, very detrimental. Um, Billy, did you correct me, Scoot? Sorry. You're still muted. Nikki had asked how to spell it. So I just- I, Oh, I it sorry. In. I thought you were correcting something. No, no. Um, and so I, I'll say the other thing, the armor is a really interesting feature of turtles, but I'll say a lot of animals grow armor out of bones that are essentially coming from being set in their skin. Um, what turtles do, which is, also really interesting is that they've managed to get, so, so we know that their ribs end up fused to the shell um, along with their vertebrae, but they somehow got their, uh, if you think of it this way, their shoulder inside the ribs. Um, and so it's, it is one of the little evolutionary changes with their body plan that 
Um, I don't know that any, there's any other vertebrate that does that, that gets sort of, or that gets sort of the shoulder girdle inside. Um, and so if you think of us, you know, obviously our lungs are, 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 are all that's inside of our ribs along with some other organ. Um, the other, other fun things about uh, the turtle body plan that way is that because their ribs are fused to their shell, um, they can't breathe like we do. Like we expand and contract our rib cage when we breathe. Um, but turtles basically rely on um, sort of moving the rest of their body a bit to, to be able to pull, to, to sort of shrink and expand their lungs to pull air in and out. Um, so in a way, when you see a box turtle all sealed up, the box turtle is holding its breath. Um, but we'll, we'll get more into that in a minute. Or other turtles that breathe through their butts when they're hibernating. That's a whole other thing. Um, actually, Billy, you're up with other Philly turtles. You're still muted. There, I'm not muted anymore. Okay. You are so not. In Philadelphia, um, I'll talk about the kinds of turtles that you tend to see the most. Um, and most of them you're going to see in the water. The box turtle is really the only turtle that we have that spends a lot of time out of the water. Uh, we have painted turtles, which are small, relatively flat looking, mostly black turtles with some yellow and red markings in the skin and the edge of the shell. Um, you see a lot of those, especially in slower bodies of water. Um, we've got red bellied turtles, or sometimes called cooters, which um, have, as you can see in this picture, you can see some red on the shell, but also that kind of orange red uh, plastron we're talking about, the belly. Um, these are, these tend to be our, some of our biggest turtles that you see basking. And they, uh, they like, um, they'll be in our ponds, they'll also be in our rivers. Uh, and they are, th they're, they are threatened. I think the state status is threatened. Um, because they don't have much of a range in Pennsylvania, and all of it is basically in a coastal plain or, or near Philadelphia. And most of that's been developed. Um, then we have snapping turtles. So moving, I guess, clockwise in this, this, these four pictures. Snapping turtles, big, you know, beasts of turtles. They can get to be maybe up to 50 pounds. Um, they don't bask very much, so there will be more snapping turtles than you tend to see. Um, they have a mean reputation because when they're defensive, they bite. Um, you would too, but they bite really hard. Um, and, uh, but they're, they're actually really, really um, easygoing when you're not trying to pick them up. Um, I have stepped on snapping turtles by accident many, well, not many, definitely more than once. And every time what they do is they sort of freeze and pretend they're a rock. Um, and uh, they only really start snapping once you grab them. Um, and then the last one, the one that's floating in the water there, it's the red-eared slider. These are not native. Um, they are commonly sold as pets, little green turtles with red stripes on the sides of their heads. And since they actually make terrible pets, um, they, I mean, they're hard to keep. They get big, they're kind of smelly. Um, people end up dumping them into our waterways. Most of those probably die, but enough have lived um, out of the how many thousands that have been dumped in there that um, they have become pretty well established. And there's some concern that they compete with um, and maybe push out of the way a little bit are, are painted and red bellied turtles. Um, and then there's some other turtles you don't see quite so often, um, some like spiny soft shells, map turtles, I'm not gonna get into here very much because uh, they're sort of the ones you're more, less likely to see. And so with that, I think we'll um, carry on to talking more about the box turtles that, that that everybody's tuning in to see now. Oops. Now I have to unmute. <laughs> so with that, um, I wanna just touch on the catalyst really for this particular um, Philly box turtle talk was actually, so I, I live in Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia and um, I thought it was odd because for the past three years, there's been a random box turtle that shows up in my backyard once or twice a year. I usually see maybe once in the spring and then again, once in the fall. And I thought that was the most bizarre thing ever. Um, but I chalked it up as a one-off bizarre thing until recently in one of our local Facebook forums for the neighborhood, somebody else posted that they had a box turtle in their backyard. 
um, which led to a spate of other people. I mean, I would definitely say half a dozen or more folks that have all said, yes, we've had box turtles in our backyard or, you know, we've had multiple box turtles throughout our backyard. So it just felt to Billy and I as very unique and very strange um, to have box turtles in such a developed urban area um, that we thought it was worth kind of teaching about it and doing a talk about it. Um, so again, that was kind of the catalyst for it. Um, that being said, I'm trying to keep an eye out for the box turtle that I've had in my backyard to be able to use him for the program. And we were lucky enough to find him recently, a couple of yards over in a neighbor's yard. So we brought him over to our yard and have kind of, kind of kept an eye on him um, for the past week to be able to use him for the, the program. So um, I did bring him. So this, um, we've lovingly named him George. <laughs> Um, so George is the, what we believe to be male, fairly certain a male box turtle that's been showing up in our yard. Don't know where he came from. Um, don't know why he's here or even where he goes in winters. But like I said, it's been at least three years since he's been around. Um, and while I'm kind of holding him, we'll go over some of the, um, some of the box turtle sort of basics and things about box turtles. Um, and then we can we can throw that slide back up too if we want to, just to see some of the cool um, colors and patterns on box turtles. So um, just a little bit about um, box turtles in particular. Sorry, I'm gonna exit full screen so I can see my notes too. There are actually several species of box turtles. They're in both throughout North America and Asia as well. Um, our Eastern box turtle, which is what George is, is, can be found throughout the Eastern United States, obviously from Maine all the way down to Florida and then west out towards Michigan and then south down to Texas. So they they get around, they're pretty um, prevalent in the Eastern United States. Um, they typically live near rivers, streams, ponds, marshes, open woodlands, pastures, marshy meadows. So they kind of have a slight variety of habitat. Um, and they're not great swimmers, but they actually can go in waters and they like to soak and swim a little bit. So it's interesting because one of the things um, that most people look at in terms of differences between turtles and tortoises is, do they frequent land more? Do they frequent water? Now, box turtles tend to, and Billy, you may be able to correct me on this, tend to kind of straddle the line of both. Um, we're going to go into their names in a slide or two, but um, their scientific name, terrapine, is usually reserved more for turtles. Um, but often you can tell the difference between a turtle and a tortoise based on sort of their, their foot. So most turtles and swimming turtles will have more of a, you know, foot that's more flat, more flipper-like for swimming, longer toes to help them swim, whereas tortoises will have more of a, a stump foot for walking on land. But um, box turtles are one of the ones that tend to kind of straddle both of those. Billy, do you want to chime in and correct anything? I'll just say that, that tortoises, it's a, it's a term that used to not be as specific as we use it today. Um, so I've sense. seen like in older writings, people even talking about like sea turtles as tortoises, um, which always struck me as funny. Um, but the, the, uh, but there's the box turtles. Um, when you see turtles that adapt to living on land, they tend to look, they have a more of a domed shell usually. Um, and like Sandy pointed out, their feet change. You don't need to have uh, webbed toes to walk on land. So they just tend to lose those. Um, and box turtles, uh, just, I don't know, fact about them is that they are, I think the last time I saw something about their genetics, they're most closely related to another small kind of turtle that we have called a spotted turtle, um, which is, uh, it's a turtle that, actually I, I used in the slide before we were looking at turtle shells, um, but they're flatter and they are more of a marsh, uh, shallow water kind of species. We don't have them in Philadelphia, probably used to, but they're vulnerable to development of wet habitat and collection of pets, which we'll talk more about later. We will. Um, and I'm also being conscious of your time, Nikki. I know you said it had, you had to jump off in 10 minutes or so, but I do want to make sure, and Billy, I don't know if you're able to put um, my email or the email that we're using specifically for the website in. So Nikki, I know you mentioned you were in pre-K. So if there's ever anything, um, you know, more specific to turtles that you wanted to use with any of the, you know, your little ones or to share with anyone, I'm happy to be a resource and help out with that as well. Um, but back to box turtles. Um, so box turtles uh, are one of Pennsylvania's most familiar uh, reptiles and definitely more easily recognized of all of our reptiles and amphibians alike. Um, they tend to be absolutely stunningly beautiful reptiles, as you can see on the slideshow, just the variety 
of patterns and, and bright colors throughout their shell. And each one is gonna have a really unique design, different splotches, streaks, dabs of color, it just makes them just really, really pretty reptiles. Um, their colors can vary a lot from yellow to orange to olive, brown, black. Um, as you can see, George tends to be a little bit of a darker color. He's got the orange, but he's got a lot of brown. The other one that I saw on that thread was almost brightly, um, more brightly yellow all over with smaller brown spots. So it was um, pretty stark difference, a striking difference from, from this guy here. Um, so again, as we talked about, turtles um, have dry, scaly skin, claws on their toes, that domed upper shell or carapace. Um, and their lower shell or their plastron, and I'm going to turn them gently because it's actually not really great to turn turtles over too much. Um, but one of the things that makes box turtles really particularly special is their bottom shell or their plastron has a hinge on it. Now, he does not seem to want to do it. But as Billy was saying, they can actually close that up tight so he can, and he's peeing on me again. Brilliant. Um, they can pull their legs and head fully into their shell and close that hinge so it completely protects them and they're completely um, within that shell and safe, which is a thing that um, most turtles, other than box turtles, can't do. They can't pull themselves completely in, and, and you know, particularly their head and legs and close it. Um, so it's one thing that makes box turtles unique. In fact, it's a common thought that that's where the name box turtle comes from, the ability to pull themselves in and kind of keep themselves closed like a box. Um, Turtles also, what's really interesting, not a lot of folks know, is that they actually lost their teeth sometime during the course of evolution. So now um, most turtles have a really sharp beak. I don't know if you can see it, his isn't as sharp. Um, so turtles actually have beaks, which a lot of folks think is really funny. Um, one of the things, and I don't know if we go into it in another slide, is one of the ways that you can tell um, male and female turtles apart. Outside of in box turtles, sometimes they say that the male box turtles will have an orange, more of an orange uh, iris. He's peeing on me again. Awesome. But also if you look at their plastron, males will actually have a concave plastron, um, whereas females, it'll be more flat. Um, and it's believed that that's for mating so that the, the males can sit more easily on top of the females. Um, yeah. Billy, anything to add? Did I miss anything just in general about box turtles? Only thing that I should have gotten a picture of mating box turtles because it's one of the funniest things you're ever going to see. Um, because be. you just think of, <laughs> of trying to fit one hard object on top of another round hard object. Um, they end up sort of just up at like almost a 90 degree angle. Um, but yeah, it's a, they're, um, the, said so nothing else to add about the shell discussion. Awesome. But, um, there is one, I want to just jump ahead just a quick second because Nikki, you do have to go in a couple minutes, but because you're pre-K. So before we get into the next part, one of the things that I was going to show later on um, when it, when we're going into more about how you can help box turtles and, um, you know, what you all can do to help educate about them or you can do in your yards um, or around your houses is I was going to show um, a really great resource, a really great book, especially for um educators and pre-k educators so if you ever get a chance this is a great one especially with speech and language so this is box turtle at long pond by william t george um it's a really have you heard, do you know that one no it's a really good one um what i can do is i can make sure that there's a link um maybe in the chat i can try to drop one in at some point but it's a really really great one um it's it's pretty scientifically accurate. The pictures are just stunning. It's a little bit of a long read, um, but it's, it's, it's a good one. I like using it a lot to teach. You can often read it in parts too, but it's, it's a great one for teaching about turtles because it is, it's accurate. Um, sorry, I know I skipped ahead a little bit, but I want to make sure before you go, you got that piece of it. Um, so um, one of the things we wanted to talk about a little bit um, with box turtles in particular, because of the land that we sort of stand on today um, is a little bit about where the scientific name comes from and a little bit more about its importance to, to our indigenous area. So the scientific name is for box turtle is Terrapine Carolina. Um, so the word Terrapine is adapted from Algonquin, it means turtle. <laughs> um, and Carolina comes from obviously the Carolinas, which is where the species was first described. Um, so where we reside today is Lenapahakan. So it's the land belonging to the turtle clan of the Natakote Lenape. Um, so 
Nikki, I don't know what area you're from, but if you're ever down in- I'm in Fishtown too. <laughs> oh, so you know. So have you seen the box turtle lamps down by Penn? Uh, yeah, yeah. That was going to be my question. I was going to ask if you were familiar with the the posts yeah. down on Delaware Ave. Yeah. Yeah. So they're stunning. Um, I love them. So we, I did run out this morning in the good morning sun to take some good pictures of them. But yeah, so the la lampposts obviously represent that turtle clan of the Lenny Lenape. Um, so it's just, I think that's just such an important connection to make. And it's a really lovely um, connection with our local box turtles. Um, it's also actually believed that because box turtles are so slow and sort of their lumbering gait, um, that the Lenape would often refer to them as sticky heels. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about our history and the land on which we reside and how important box turtles are to that. Um, so a little bit more about box turtle behavior. Um, so throughout Pennsylvania, box turtles hibernate for the winter. Um, they often dig into stream bottoms, stump holes, they'll go into old mammal burrows. I'm pretty sure mine digs under old invasive plants and trash maybe in a neighbor's yard. I don't know where he goes. I'm gonna put a GoPro on him one time. Um, but they have been observed to hibernate in the same space year after year. So they, they like that sort of consistency. They like things that they know and what they find to be safe and productive for their survival. Um, what they'll do is they'll often dig out their overwintering sites in late in the spring in March or April. And then they're active usually until about October. Um, in the spring, um, what they do in the spring and summer is they'll forage, they'll gain weight. They'll literally sort of, as Billy alluded to, they'll bump into their mates um, and then they'll lay eggs. Um, box turtles are omnivores, which means they obviously both eat plants and animals. Um, so they're not too picky, usually with some reptiles, turtles, um, it's, if it fits, it goes in. Um, so their diet will include fish, frogs, salamanders, snails, slugs, worms, mushrooms, as Billy said, roots, flowers, berries. Sometimes they'll even eat dead animals or carrion. Um, when they're younger, they tend to eat a little bit more meat. And then as adults, it's, they'll lean more towards mostly plant matter. Um, female box turtles usually lay between three and 11 eggs in the nest that they dig out using their strong back or hind legs. Um, they can actually lay several sets of eggs or clutches each year. Um, they take about three months or so to hatch. Um, usually after one successful mating, uh, a female can even lay fertile eggs for up to four years. Um, so they can actually, um, they can actually retain that sperm and continue to have clutches and lay eggs after. Were you going to add something? I realized I was about to cough and then I said, wait, am I muted? And then I'm not. So. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Raccoons will often eat the eggs and hatchlings. Um, so any box turtle that does survive that juvenile stage um, has a shot at living sometimes longer than most humans, amazingly. Box turtles have been known to potentially live up to over a hundred years. Um, so yeah, that's just some of the fun facts about box turtles. Um, now, um, box turtles actually have some major threats. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about that and then how we can help. Oh, I do have that link. Hold on. Speaking of, since you're still on here, I'm going to drop that link to the box turtle book in the chat for you, Nikki, if you need to see it. There it is. Okay. Um, so box turtles, true threat, th true threat is actually sadly humans. Um, because box turtles are so beautiful and charismatic, it often works against them. Many of them are collected and taken home as pets, um, which has actually made them nearly extinct in some places. Um, that alongside with habitat fragmentation due to development, um, you know, loss of habitat obviously in that, um, overdevelopment and dangerous roadways causing roadkill. Um, Interestingly enough, one study found that some drivers actually will intentionally swerve out of their way to hit them, which sadly, I have a place up in the mountains and I, I've seen that too often, not just turtles, but I think a lot of folks, if they don't understand it, they tend to not like it. Um, outside of that, predators that do well around humans um, and whose populations are boosted by us are trash, things like that. Raccoons, skunks, crows will dig up their nests. Um, hatchlings can fall prey to dogs and cats. Um, so with that, most box turtle populations that live near humans are in decline. Um, and even though box turtles have had a hard run, there are ways that we can lend a hand and help ensure their survival. Um, 
So we'll go into some of the ways to help. All right. Actually, and so I think Nikki, you're about to, to jump off. I just so put I'm it in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank Absolutely. You. Yeah. And feel free. Um, my email, I'm going to just drop it in real fast. It's just sure. Sandy at child's inspiration. Okay. I was going to ask, have you ever linked up with um, Skype a scientist or have you, are you familiar? I've heard of it. Um, I don't know if it's a specific organization that runs it or if it's just more like depending on who's doing it. Yeah, my best bet is that it is somebody who I think lives in Fishtown as well. Do you, are you familiar with the Squidmobile? No, but that sounds fascinating. <laughs> it's if you walk around Loco Pez sometimes, there's an SUV that's called the Squidmobile. It's like decorate all decked out. I may have seen it. There's a number you can text and it's a okay. person. Um, awesome. Tells you squid facts. Anyways, uh, I think that's the person who runs it. And she basically links classroom teachers with, with scientists um, all across the board. Neural, I think somebody came into my pre-K and she talked about her um, science research um, with mice and but she's had dabbled throughout her career and other other animals. So it was it worked out with with the, with the preschoolers. Yeah, that sounds fast. I will have to look at it. I'm right around the corner from local pets. So I'll have to okay. and I'll look it up too to see. Yeah, sure, maybe sure, FNA sure. might have some stuff too. But yeah, Nikki, thank you so much. Yeah, this was great. Thank you. Yeah, let us know if you need anything. Great, great, great. See ya. Yay. All right. So I'll keep talking um, about good. how we can help fox turtles. Um, and so we'll, we'll <clears throat> bid, bid good night to Nikki and, and keep talking to folks who are tuning in later. All right. Um, give me one second. I'll just clear my throat really quick. Thank you. Sign us to strike again. Okay. So um, we have a lot of ways we can help box turtles. We talked about some of the threats. Uh, I always, you know, one of the things we recommend to start with is helping scientists and conservation agencies learn more about where box turtles are and how they're doing. Um, and a big part of that is documenting box turtles that we find. Um, a lot of critters are hard to catch and get pictures of. Um, if you've ever tried to get a picture of a dragonfly, you might know what I'm thinking right there. Um, but it's a lot easier to get a picture of a box turtle if it's walking right in front of you um, on the trail or if you find it in your yard or a cemetery or something like that. Um, it's easy to pull the camera out or the phone out rather and get a picture. Um, and then you can submit that uh, in a couple of different ways to something called the PA Amphibian and Reptile Survey or PARS. PARS has a website of its own, PA Herp Survey, where you can get more information on um, how to submit observations. Also, if you use iNaturalist, there is a PARS project in iNaturalist that you can also contribute the observation that you might make to. Um, and that will reach uh, basically state conservation agencies that, that keep an eye on box turtles. All right. Back to you, Sandy. Ah, perfect. Um, so how to help. Um, so as we talked about before, and just to kind of reiterate, populations of box turtles, especially in urban or what we called fragmented habitat, so areas that they've lost that longer strips of, of forest or, or successful habitat um, that has been broken, fragmented habitats may be composed primarily of often senior turtles or adults that are no longer reproducing. Um, so if you have a population that consists of non-reproducing turtles, that's going to put those populations on a potential long, slow slide towards extinction. So once those adult turtles that are not producing die off, you no longer have a box turtle population or a viable box turtle population. Um, so as we talked about, sadly, habitat loss and fragmentation are not their only threats. Um, again, reiterating that even though state and international regulations protect box turtles, um, we did talk about that often they're taken from the wild by humans. Um, and again, roadkill is reducing their numbers even more, but there are ways that you can help those very specific. Um, Sandy, I just thought to chime in something really quick. Please just do. To, we should emphasize that George um, is going out, back outside right after this. Correct. Um, Thank this you. is a turtle that lives on your block um, and lives in the area. Uh, and uh, you just detained him for the night to be part of the, the presentation. But after this, he's going to be going back to his outdoor lifestyle. 
Yes, not only detain him for the night, but in the process of waiting on the permits for educational use of box turtles and things so that, you know, this is all above board. Um, but no, thank you so much for pointing that out. Yes, he has borrowed and returned back to his habitat, which is kind of some of the things that we're going to talk about, the no's and the don'ts and the how you can help. Um, so the number one thing is if you see a box turtle crossing a street, the best thing to do is to move it carefully to the side of the road in the direction it was heading. So that's really important. So you never want to take a box turtle and put it somewhere different or take a box turtle and you know put him in the opposite direction that he was going because turtles are um, they're sort of laser focused on where they want to go and what they're going to do. So if you do turn him around and put him in the opposite direction, he's going to turn right back around and head back in the direction across that dangerous street again that he was heading. So feel free to help a box turtle safely cross the street in the direction that they're heading. Um, one of the best analogies that I have ever heard um, about that is thinking about um, a granny uh, crossing the street. So someone's grandma crossing the street, you wouldn't want to turn her back around and, you know, face her back to the direction she was the opposite direction she was going, because obviously that would confuse her and she would be angry at you. Um, so treat box turtles like you would treat, uh, your grandma. Don't send them in the opposite directions. Um, other one is never, never take a box turtle home as a pet. As we talked about, that's one of the number one reasons for their decline or move it to a location where you think it's going to do better. Um, the turtle's going to know best where it's going to do better. As, as you know, we said with George, he's been popping up in my backyard now for, for three years successfully, and he's doing just fine out there. So as you know, as much as that may not seem like an ideal habitat for him as, and, and as well as these other box turtles that seem to be popping up in urban fish town, they are figuring it out they're surviving um so we don't want to move them to some place we think is better um just a sort of scary anecdote i did someone did reach out to me at one point because someone i guess found a box turtle and put it in the delaware river down by penn treaty i think at some point somebody told me that happened so that's not a great place for a box turtle to be in the delaware river um i guess they didn't know better and thought it was a water turtle but again leave them be um Aside from actually moving uh, box turtles being illegal, um, again, they are protected statewide and internationally. It's actually a significant significant problem for populations near people because it's one less box turtle that can reproduce in the wild. And again, like we said, relocated turtles do poorly in new locations, things that are unfamiliar to them, um, unfamiliar local food sources, unfamiliar hiding places, unfamiliar dangers can all pose a major risk. And like we said, they often make a beeline back to their original homes, which can expose them back to road traffic and other hazards along the way. Um, it's also been said too that a box turtle will just kind of roam endlessly looking to find their original home, um, sort of a poor existence. Um, and I'm gonna reiterate again, if you find a box turtle in a place you think is poor habitat, just err on the side of leaving it where it is. Um, we said it's probably been surviving for a long time. Um, we talked about too, there may be some exceptions. Let's talk about Fishtown. If it's crossing Lehigh Ave or on the side of Lehigh Ave, you might want to move it to a safer space across the road where it was heading. Um, so yeah, those are some ways that you can help box turtles. Um, and then one of the other ways that you can really help not only box turtles, but other local wildlife um, is to garden for box turtles, um, not as a place to bring them to, but to just provide a habitat. Um, so plant native, plant native, plant native. Um, you can support box turtles by planting native species that may provide their favorite turtle treats, turtle fruits. Um, may, apple, may apples are great, summer grape, pokeweed, um, jack in the pulpit, black huckleberry, elderberry, blackberry, um, we talked about raspberry bushes earlier. So, um, you know, things that you can plant that are native plants that are great host plants for some things and provide um, great food and shelter is really, really great for habitat for turtles and other animals. Um, so if you have sunny areas, you can grow some of these berry brambles. You can let the ripened berries fall to the ground. Um, it's also helpful to choose species that fruit at different times during the season. Um, so if you have fruit that may come out in the spring, it'll provide food in the spring and then in the fall, you'll also provide fruit and food in the fall. Um, when we did our intro, we talked a little bit about the Child's Inspiration Wildlife Discovery Garden and Nature Heroes. Um, the Discovery Garden sort of being a demonstration garden. That's a lot of what we like to do is try to grow native plants and try to utilize the space as animal habitat. So leaving behind um, 
brush piles and things like that, that that may provide habitat and things like that. So if you ever have any questions or want um, any additional resources or support for wildlife habitat gardening, reach out. Um, uh, the email address, as we talked about and put it in the chat for Nikki earlier, is just sandy, S-A-N-D-I, at childsinspiration.org, or you can check out phillynature.org. There is ways to contact us there as well. Um, as I alluded to, leaving large areas of um, natural leaf litter beneath trees. Um, we talked about brush piles, you know, stick piles, things like that. Um, so that turtles can remain camouflaged and help them forage for food. It's where a lot of worms and things will also like to hide that they might go to get. Providing places that they can spend the night or over winter, you know, building up those brush piles on top of soft, loose soil, layering branches and leaf litter helps to give them nice habitat or nice overwintering places. Um, any moist areas that you have, rain gardens, um, helps turtles during the hottest parts of the day. So turtles often don't like to be out and about in the hottest parts of summer and the hottest parts of the day. They'll go and kind of go under some shade and some shelter to kind of help cool them off a little bit. Um, so that's a great thing that you can do. Um, isolated clearings can provide box turtles areas that they can travel, they can mate, they can bask. So if there are some areas that they can kind of move around in. Um, which they also like to lay their eggs in those sunny spots. Um, if you have a yard that you're going to be doing any potential weed whacking or mowing, um, try to walk the area ahead of time in search of turtles or other animals. Um, if you do mow, um, another good time to do it is in the um, on a dry day at midday. We talked about that hot sort of, it might not be fun for you, but it helps the turtles. Um, sort of that, you know, midday, um, sort of summer, midday, hot sun when the turtles are less likely to be out and about. Um, and with all of this being said, if you are providing turtle habitats, um, try to do it as far away from possible as possible from roadways, from deadly roadways. So you're not encouraging them to be closer to those areas that are not safe. Cool. All right. And with that, Billy, you are up. So what got us started on this whole topic is that as Sandy said, there are a bunch of turtle observations in an unlikely area. So um, I would, if you'd ask me this, and Sandy, I remember the text exchange, because Sandy texted me a picture of, actually that picture of, uh, of I think that's George on the left. Um, it is. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I, I just couldn't quite get my head around it. And you're like, oh no, there's more. Um, because I, 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 you know, three weeks ago, I would have said, oh, we find box turtles in, are larger green spaces. And I'm actually gonna be careful about not saying exactly where, um, because as we said before, one of the biggest threats to box turtles is people taking them home for pets. Um, and so they're one of those animals, like a lot of, unfortunately, like a lot of other turtles, um, you know, say spotted turtles, things like that, uh, or a lot of snakes even, that we don't wanna say where exactly they are. If you find one, um, try to be as vague as you can be about where you saw it, just so you don't um, clue in anybody who uh, might be looking to take it as a pet. Or, and then this is going to maybe surprise some people who are watching and listening to this, um, but there's actually a pretty decent sized trade of North American turtles to China, where turtles are used for uh, medicinal, uh, culinary medicinal purposes. Uh, and so, with rising incomes in China as it's developed, there's been more of a demand for um, a lot of exotic wildlife, but we see a lot of um, box turtles ending up getting shipped to, um, to China um, illegally, uh, but um, still happens. And um, so it's, uh, it's kind of a sad way to have to approach the world, but you wanna be a little paranoid when you're um, sharing information about turtles, especially if you're doing it on some kind of public forum, um, whether that's social media or something else like that. So I'll say that, um, box turtles pop up in a few areas in some of our larger green spaces in Philadelphia. Um, they also can pop up, as we, we've been learning, in sort of um, in areas that have been built up for a long time. So George, um, maybe George is like 60 years old. I don't know. George could be 100 years old. Um, it's, it's actually, it's hard to tell. Um, and uh, we don't know what's, what else, what I'm now starting to think of is these neighborhood box turtles. Um, it's hard to know whether George like had lived there since before Fishtown was built up because that's a really long time ago. Fishtown's been there for a while. Um, or um, if, you know, maybe George descends from a few turtles that managed to persist on some 
like interior of the block that was kind of weedy for you know 150 years after it was originally developed um and maybe george was someone's pet that they grabbed as a young turtle um 60 years ago and let go in their backyard or more recently it's really hard to tell um so i'll say that uh you know on the one hand we want to do everything we can to protect box turtles um but have the mindset that when you find them, it's something that's really special um, and it might not be there forever. Uh, and so we wanna, we wanna sort of value those and think about what we're doing elsewhere, whether that's helping preserve habitat, you know, being careful on the roads, um, everything Sandy was just talking about, uh, that we wanna be preserving box turtles where they are. Um, and it becomes extra important um, that you don't move them. Um, you know, we were talking about how they literally, almost literally have to bump into each other to find each other to mate. You know, we think of some things like, um, like deer. Deer, you know, they, 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 they leave scent clues for each other all over the landscape. Um, when it comes time to mate, they know where each other are. They're smelling, you know, the bucks are looking for the does, that kind of thing. Um, they, they're listening for vocalizations. Box turtles, you know, their heads are like, what, maybe four inches off the ground at best. And so, if they're crawling around a meadow or forest, they can't see very far. They don't really work by scent. They don't call vocally. Um, they basically have to, to like see each other and blunder into each other to, to mate. And so if, if a few of them are getting killed on the roads and a few of them are getting taken, and that drops the, um, the density of the population below a point where they're gonna routinely run into each other, um, then that's when the population starts that, that decline. Um, and that's what we're seeing around Philadelphia. We've got a few spots where they're reproducing, but I think most of what we're finding are these older turtles that are just, that are that were part of populations that are now on the way out, um, sadly speaking. Um, so uh, it's kind of a downer place to, to wind up this part of it. I just wanna, but I wanna say that um, as we you think beyond Philadelphia, uh, that there's a lot of things we can do to preserve habitat elsewhere, but also that the things that we were talking about that make habitat better for box turtles, if you're lucky to have them around, also make habitat great for lots of other things. Um, and so it's a, it's, we hope that this is a gateway to you thinking about, um, about how you interact with wildlife, um, whatever that might be, uh, where, wherever you have some, some ability to, to build up the habitat. Perfect. All right, and so um, we're gonna guess there's no questions because it's just you and me, Sandy. <laughs> Uh, at this point in the chat. So uh, um, I'll let you wrap up. Perfect, well, where do we wanna end it, I guess? Is there anything we wanna drive home? Otherwise I can pause and we can debrief. I think I, I drove every, I drove home, but I wanted to drive home. So I think uh, um, I'll just reemphasize that uh, we'll make sure on the website that by the time you navigate over to it, um, we've got a great box turtle profile page. Um, we're gonna be adding more content about all kinds of wildlife around Philadelphia as we go. Basically, this is something where Sandy and I, we grab a few minutes you know, here and there and um, plunk away on the website and add a few more species. Um, and so it's, uh, the website's gonna keep developing, but also please be in touch if you have any questions. Um, yeah. Some other great resources I should mention. Uh, I mentioned the PA HERP survey as a place to, uh, to add observations and stuff. It's also a good place to learn about reptile amphibian diversity around Philadelphia in general. Um, and, uh, and so there's, there's that. There's also um, a website that, um, that will have a link in the box drill profile on our webpage, but there's a PA um, reptile amphibian uh, website, which is sort of a description of different reptiles and amphibians that live in Pennsylvania. There's a similar one for New Jersey. Um, that the New Jersey, uh, I forget what state agency it is that deals with turtles, but they put up. Um, and uh, those are great places to get sort of profiles of how these animals live um, in our habitat. And maybe not, maybe not Fishtown habitat, um, but <laughs> the sort of typical stuff that you see when you're hiking around Philadelphia or New Jersey. Yeah. And just to add too that, um, you know, definitely if folks have um other ideas or they would like additional resources on anything or like we had mentioned any questions please do feel free to reach out because we want to be a resource to folks and and help folks learn what they would like to learn um so feel free to reach out all right cool well thanks i am going to